got Kristen Hare, who I'm pleased to introduce. She's a physician assistant at the University of Wisconsin Department of Orthopedic. She's been there for almost six years now um, and was hired to lead in the development of the Fracture Liaison Service. And under her wonderful, meticulous direction, the service has expanded to provide not only fraction li fracture liaison services, but also bone health optimization services for pre-op elective orthopedic surgery patients. She does a wonderful job taking care of these patients, um, does a lot of education and training, both in patient care consultations within the university and through national meetings. So it's my pleasure to introduce Kristen Hare. Thank you. You can go ahead and advance the slide, please. So my patient is a 52-year-old female, now postmenopausal. She was referred to my FLS by her orthopedic provider due to a pelvic ring injury caused by a ground level fall. She tripped on an object at baggage claim at the airport and had multiple pelvis fractures out of town. She was admitted to the hospital for six days due to severe pain. She could not mobilize and then finally was able to return to Wisconsin about a week later. So here, next slide, her initial films. These are pretty radiographically occult, um, but you can see the right-sided um, sacral ala fracture um, in the CT scan. Next slide. Her past medical history is significant for scoliosis. She had a kidney stone at age 41, obstructive sleep apnea. She was diagnosed with a left breast cancer at age 47. And along with that diagnosis was found to have uh, ATM gene mutation heterozygous. So she did not have any symptoms of the syndrome um, as a child, but it um, does cause an increased risk for early breast cancer. Next slide. She had extensive scoliosis surgery as a child. Uh, initial breast cancer surgery was a partial mastectomy, but there was a positive margin. So 10 weeks later, she had a bilateral mastectomy and then ended up with a total hysterectomy uh, with bilateral uh, ovary removal at age 49. And that was primarily for risk reduction because her gene mutation also increases risk for ovarian cancer. Next. So as far as her oncology medication history, uh, she was on tamoxifen initially after her breast cancer surgery, um, then was placed on anastrozole for four months, though, and that was after her hysterectomy did not tolerate that well. Went back to tamoxifen for a while. They really felt it was important for her to be on an aromatase inhibitor due to her high-risk status for recurrence tried letrozole, that was not tolerated well at all. Um, most recently was placed on uh, eczemestine that is better tolerated, has some bone and joint aches with that, but she's able to stay on that medication. Her cancer was stage 1A when it was found, so no chemotherapy or radiation was given. Next. She's also on venlafaxine and a calcium chewable with vitamin D. Next. So she did have a bone mineral density uh, at the time she was placed on the initial aromatase inhibitor therapy. Lowest T-score was a negative 2.0 at the hip. And then about two months after her pelvis fracture, did have a follow-up bone mineral density. Bone density had decreased 10% at the hip, and she's now osteoporotic with a negative 2.7 T-score. Uh, no change at her forearm T-score, negative 1.4 currently. Femoral neck was negative 2.0 in 2020, currently negative 2.6, and there's no TBS available due to her extensive spinal hardware. Next. Um, this is just showing that the DEXA was a pretty good comparison, so we do think that that was a 10% loss. Next. Arm was also a good comparison. Next. Um, she did have a CT scan, as I showed earlier at the time of her fracture, so I was able to pull out opportunistic CT, that's L3. You can see her rods extend all the way down to L2 in that um, panel on the left, and her Hounsby units are right around uh, 100. That is a KV of 100, not 120, um, so probably is closer to 110. Next slide. As far as laboratory results, she really hadn't had very um, much 
uh, lab workup for the last couple of years. I was able to go back about uh, nine months prior or seven months prior to her fracture, normal calcium, creatinine, LCFOS, and vitamin D. At the time of her fracture, uh, still normal calcium, creatinine, uh, LCFOS, mildly elevated, not surprising. Next slide. At the time she saw me, which was an ASAP consult from her surgeon because she was still having pretty significant pain two months out. PTH was 76 with a high calcium at 10.7. Normal albumin, creatinine, vitamin D was improved. Uh, normal magnesium and phosphate. Next slide. So here we are, I just saw her in consultation. She has persistent pain that's quite severe and limiting to function. She's not been able to return back to work. She travels frequently and cannot tolerate riding in a car or an airplane, and orthopedics feels like her pelvis fractures have delayed healing. So I was concerned about that uh, calcium level, so we did repeat her labs a few weeks later. Next slide. And her PTH had increased to 103 with a calcium of 10.6. We were miraculously able to get her over to the endocrine surgery uh, clinic within a week. They did an ultrasound and localized a right superior um, structure that they felt was likely um, parathyroid adenoma. Next slide. She's able to have surgery a couple months later to have that enlarged gland removed. And next. So a 52-year-old female, um, significant pelvis fractures, and her FLS consult was found to have also um, primary hyperparathyroid has had surgery. Uh, now we're looking at what is the best uh, option to treat her osteoporosis. So I would be welcome to have any suggestions or input from the audience. Uh, Kristen, this is Paul. May maybe we could start by saying, is there anything orthopedically that can or should be done uh, given that she has significant pain and disability uh, just briefly looking at the, uh, her imaging, it does look like she could undergo percutaneous uh, sacroiliac uh, screws, which might stabilize that fracture and at least give her some improvement in her quality of life. I don't know, Dr. Cates, uh, any thoughts about that? Yeah, um, Kristen, could you put up the x-ray again the, so we could look at that? That's what I was thinking also. I wasn't able to share the screen, but I think, yeah, Diane could bring it up for me. Yeah, right there. Those are, yeah, at the time of her injury there. Yeah, so, so that fracture probably would benefit from screw fixation. Uh, I obviously need to see a little bit more, but uh, fixing it probably, you know, one certainly looks like there's a good corridor there for a S1 screw, maybe a, maybe S1 and S2 screw to, to fix it. Um, so giving, giving screw fixation will oftentimes Again, with just these images, it's kind of hard to say exactly what, but screwing it together can be done percutaneously, relieve some of the pain, it gives stability, and may stimulate some new healing at the fracture site. I, this There's is Joe. Um, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Paul. I, I was going to say, about. just anecdotally, long fusions to the pelvis. Uh, are associated with significant uh, higher incidence of pelvic insufficiency fracture. Although this fusion went down to L2, it looks like. Um, uh, the same phenomenon, given how long this has happened to her, she probably happened when she was an adolescent. Um, so it's not surprising that we start to see later in life when they get osteoporotic, particularly with acute bone loss from all of her um, oncologic treatment that she would then be giving, getting sacral fractures and uh, pelvic insufficiency fractures. So just watch out, I just mentioned that, watch out long fusions to the pelvis can transfer and you end up with pelvic insufficiency fractures. So this is Joe, can I make a couple comments? Kristen, 
I commend you for making the diagnosis of primary hyperparia, but can I ask one question? Did you do a urinary calcium? There was not a urinary calcium done. The um, endocrine okay. surgeon uh, didn't feel it was necessary. The endocrine surgeon is wrong. Okay, and I know who the endocrine surgeon is. And um, I'm, I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna speak for the endocrinologist here. In the absence of a urinary calcium, the overwhelming likelihood is that it's primary hyperparia. But if you see a hundred patients like this, you will send somebody to surgery with FHH. And there's only two outcomes possible for FHH in surgery. And that is hypoparathyroidism or persistence. So kind of like, um, uh, Steve, Steve was talking about the, you know, this is the right way to do it. Skipping steps is not a good approach to elective medicine. Urgent medicine, I get it. But uh, I don't know if any other endocrinologists there, it's in the guidelines for a reason. And it's because you will miss, I, I, I've seen a number of patients who've been sent to surgery with FHH. Um, and, you know, they've had a wasted surgery, a wasted anesthesia and sometimes a bad outcome. So just, just a point. Yeah, yeah. I would do it for the osteoporosis anyway. I think it's indicated for the evaluation of that. And, you know, I, you know, I, 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 you know, if I have an 88 year old who has a hard time doing it, I don't do it. But in someone like this, I would do it. The second comment is the tougher question. And that is, what do you do now? In the typical patient with osteoporosis who has curative parathyroid surgery, I would just let that do the trick. But this patient's on an aromatase inhibitor. And I've had this scenario and also the scenario where people are on continuing steroids. Um, and in those patients, I have treated them. Um, so I don't know, what did you guys decide to give her? Well, Joe, as long as you've decided to treat her, are you going to give her an anabolic? I was going to give her Romo. Do you have any issues with, and it's, uh, I think it's largely theoretical. You, you've got a lady with a cancer that we know tends to metastasize to the bone. Um, she had, I think, margins that were a problem at one point in time. Do you have any concern with stimulating the bone microenvironment with a bone anabolic? Well, I, I, I guess I, it's a good question. I might be a little reluctant to use teriparatide or, or abaloparatide, but I think I would consider using um, Romo. I don't know. Would you? You know, I, I don't know. Um, I, I, you know, somehow or another, when we use bone anabolics, we get these big 10, 15% increases in spine BMD. Especially Romo. Uh, and, you know, it strikes me that, that there is blood supply to the bones. Uh, and if we're cranking bone anabolism, regardless of what drug, uh, are we somehow doing badness to microfoci of cancer? I do not know. Yeah, and, and I think your point's well taken because she's not 20 years out. She's just a few years out. <clears throat> so I am, I am more anxious. And, and so that might be what I think is even more interesting question is if you see a patient with cancer who happens to have primary hyperpara and maybe they have uh, high risk for bone mess. Does that increase the risk from stimulating the bone microenvironment? I don't know. Uh, it's a it's it's a it's a good question. So tell me what you guys are going to do. So she saw her oncologist and follow up a few weeks ago, and they very strongly want her to have uh, salicylic acid. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. I, I I would be I'd be comfortable with that. Um, I mean, I, I think, I think if, if she weren't on an aromatase inhibitor, I wouldn't do anything because the increases in bone mass associated with curative parathyroid surgery 
you know, like 8%. I mean, it's good. Um, and I wouldn't do anything, but I think, um, I think, uh, I think in, in this setting, I agree with giving something. And I certainly, this is, uh, this is Andrew. I appreciate the discussion. I think it's been excellent so far. It seems like this patient has two separate problems. The first is she has a non-healing sacral insufficiency fracture. And then the second is long-term, she has an increased fracture risk. And so do you have any concerns using zoledronic acid in the setting of a non-healing you know, sacral fracture? And would there be any indication for even short-term use of a parathyroid hormone analog, even for three to six months to see if you can avoid any sacral screws, see if you can stimulate some healing and then perhaps transfer her to something else once the fracture is healed and her symptoms are better and she's much more mobile. I, I will just comment that to my knowledge, there is no data that bisphosphonates impair healing of fractures. Um, I think that's so, true. And I don't mean to interrupt you, but is there any data in the setting of a, like a non-union? I, I, I don't the know. Biology the is already sort of failing her right now. It's, it's not necessarily an unstable fracture. It's just biology in and of itself isn't allowing that fracture to heal. So slowing that down with an anti-resorptive gives me at least some angst, but I, I don't have any papers that I can point to saying in the center of a non-union using like a, a bisphosphonate is going to further delay healing or anything. Yeah. Like that. I, I think I would share Neil's concern in this patient particularly with teriparatide and abaloparatide. I, I, I wouldn't fault anyone for doing it, but I'm anxious about doing it, especially with the recency of her cancer. It's, I, I, that's just my, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think this is, this is why they call it the practice of medicine rather than yeah. the science of medicine. I, and a long time ago, a real wise physician said, do no harm. And, and so uh, I would, I worry in the setting of breast cancer, recent, not great margins. Um, I, I hear what you're saying uh, that uh, uh, you'd like to do something good to stimulate her healing around this. Um, it just is physiologically concerning, I think. But there isn't I completely right agree. Answer. I've I've had a few patients with very similar presentations, cancer history, and my tendency, even if they don't have an elk foss, even if they don't have any known bone mats or any other, you know, egregious risk factors, I tend to shy away from the PTH analogs. And I've had some patients with pelvic insufficiency fractures that go on to non-union from radiation therapy or whatever it is. And I've put them on romosozumab and they've done well clinically, but it, it hasn't led to fracture healing. And I don't think there's any data that Romo is going to uh, accelerate the healing process. So yeah, I, and more for um, playing devil's advocate and just spurring conversation. I wanted to gather your input on PTH analogs in a patient like this. So I appreciate your comments. But to that, to that same question, Andrew, the data that parathyroid hormone analogs heal fractures is incredibly weak. Well, and, the and, only... and they're mostly case reports but the, the studies say maybe improved to functionality, but not actual healing. Am I correct, Paul? The only, there was one study, a randomized controlled trial on pelvic insufficiency fracture that showed early pain relief, better function and more rapid healing. However, there were two similar studies done that showed no difference with PTH analogs. The one that was positive was not teriparatide, but it was the weekly version uh, of the drug rather than the daily. In Japan. Infected. Yeah. Was it so I, I don't know. I, there are certainly meta-analysis don't show any harm on healing from bisphosphonates, but they also do not show any benefit from healing from anabolics. I think both of them are neutral. Now, Andrew brings up a good uh, thought, though, is if you have an established non-union or delayed union, do you really want that person to have an anti-resorptive drug? I don't really answer that question, but it would, as an orthopedic surgeon, it would certainly concern me. And I don't know, Dr. Cates actually wrote a paper about the effects of bone of fracture healing from these different medications. I don't know if he's still on the line. If yeah, I'm still it. here. It, 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 what you said is right, Paul. It doesn't interfere with fracture healing. Um, but Kristen, I wanted to get back to you with the clinical uh, scenario you presented. The patient has pain when she weight bears, right? It, it 
was quite severe. It's actually improved a lot since her parathyroidectomy. Her pain's about 50% less three months out from her surgery. So it has actually gotten a lot better. She's able to do some physical therapy now that she couldn't do before. So I think there's probably finally some signs of healing. Yeah, if, if it doesn't heal, I, it's not a very big surgery to put a screw in percutaneously. And yep. that that does correlate with healing fracture. So, um, you know, a dose of stainless steel might help here. Um, but the, um, uh, the bisphosphonate, I don't think will interfere with healing, but it isn't going to help healing. And uh, I, I agree with what uh, was said earlier, just fixing the power, hyperparathyroidism is the cure for much of it. When they put a, a, a the screw in, do you also put cement in? No. Okay, just a screw. Okay. No, you, you basically, you position the patient in the supine position with the x-ray machine. You put in a skinny guide wire that crosses the fracture. It goes through the uh, wing of the ilium uh, posteriorly goes right through the fracture and into the body of the S1 vertebra. And using the image intensifier, we rotate it and you measure the guide wire and then you put in a screw that length with a washer so the head of the screw doesn't smush into the bone. Um, sometimes you can put in two screws even and it does give enough stability to relieve pain in some of these folks and it's not a very big surgery, so. When, when I hear the, the IR people say sacroplasty, is that what that is? Or is that oh, something a little different? They're injecting uh, polymethyl methacrylate bone cement into the fracture site. Um, they, they stick a big needle in and inject the bone cement in. Um, this is actually just putting stainless steel and screwing, screwing okay. it together so that it, uh, you know, when you drill through it, it stimulates some healing. Yep. Um, uh, usually even an experienced surgeon, you don't get the wire in the place on the first try. It may take several tries to get the wire right. So you've made a few holes in it and stimulate some bleeding and some healing there. And uh, they typically heal pretty reliably once it's screwed back together. Thanks. Yeah, sacroplasty is, is not the uh, most efficacious operation in my uh, experience and also it's a little bit more fraught with complications because the sacral nerve roots are running through the sacrum and it'd be very easy for that cement to extravasate and uh, injure one of the sacral roots. That makes sense. Thank you. Thank, thank you all and uh, Got a good pickup, Kristen. I mean, it really, that is really the most important thing you could have done to the patient. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Until next time, stay tuned and hopefully we'll see you all in person next spring. Have a good night. <laughs>